I was at the University of Washington for the past uh, many years, so pretty much all of the work that I am going to be talking about today uh, is things that I did there. And then, yeah, I'm starting at Northeastern next year, so technically I'm on vacation right now. Um, but I'm going to be talking about a lot of the work that I've been doing and how that we can use video games for problem solving. Because, uh, you know, video games are really good at actually engaging people in solving problems, like um, taking people's attention and, and energy and effort and focusing that on solving problems. But usually the problems that they're solving in the game are just a problem that was made up for the game so that they could, they could have fun solving it. Um, and so I'm kind of interested in what we can do if we can take uh, the, that, that effort of solving problems and put it towards solving problems in the real world. And the main uh, benefit, I think, from this is that we can combine uh, human creativity and problem solving and, and uh, spatial reasoning and those kinds of um, things that, that people have and are very good at and combine that with the computational power that we have to sort of compute and crunch numbers and solve problems. And actually by combining both humans and computers, uh, put that effort towards solving problems that neither humans nor computers would be able to solve alone. And also through kind of the game um, environment, actually train people up to the point where they can make contributions to be able to help solve these problems and also give players new opportunities to get involved in um, areas of research that interest them in kind of a citizen science kind of way. So the main question was, how could we use a game to solve a problem? Uh, first, we would actually have to make a game and find a problem that, that we were interested in solving. And so to answer that question, a lot of my work as a graduate student was focused on uh, solving problems related to proteins and protein folding uh, with, and, and scientific discovery within the domain of biochemistry. And in particular, this was with a game called Fold It that I'll be describing for, uh, I'll be discussing Fold It and some of the results that we got for the, the initial part of the talk. And then I'll talk about some new games that we're working on um, towards the end. But just to give a little background on why um, we made Fold It and uh, the problem that we were trying to solve is, I'm gonna talk a little bit about <laughs> proteins and, and protein folding and why we thought that that might make a good game to let players get involved in and help out with. So proteins are these biological molecules that are part of living things. They're sometimes called the machines of the cell. There's, there's sort of how things get done at the molecular level. Um, they include doing things like protecting against disease, uh, muscle movement, digestion, manipulating DNA, and they, they perform a, a wide array of functions within the cell. But the most important thing to uh, remember about proteins is that their structure determines their function. So if you want to understand how a protein does what it does, um, you have to know what shape that protein takes. Like what are the 3D positions of, of all the atoms that make up the molecule. Um, and so, so yeah, so if you want to understand the function of a protein and in some sense how life works, you want to understand the shape and you want to know the shape that that protein takes. So all proteins are made from smaller molecules called amino acids that get chained together. And every protein essentially has a unique sequence of amino acids that defines it uh, that are oftentimes represented as a string of characters with one letter for each amino acid and there are 20 to choose from. And again, each unique sequence of amino acids will fold up into one unique protein structure. And this is sometimes called its native structure um, or the, because that's the, the structure that it takes in nature. Uh, this is also sort of the, the lowest energy structure that this particular configuration of amino acids can take. And so there are a lot of sequences and there are a lot of structures that exist. Then there are a lot that we know the structure of, but they're actually, because it's a lot easier to determine sequence information, so it's a lot easier to determine the amino acids that make up a particular protein, um, and it is quite hard to actually determine what shape that protein is going to fold up into. Uh, there are a lot of proteins for which we know the sequence of amino acids that make up the protein, but we don't know the structure. And so this is what's oftentimes called the protein structure prediction problem, which is given a sequence of amino acids, can you determine basically the 3D position of all the atoms 
that make up that protein in its native um, folded structure. And so because of this, the gap between the number of known protein sequences of amino acids and the number of known protein structures is actually getting wider and wider every year. So there are all these protein sequences that we know, but we don't know what structure they fold up into, and so we can't really understand their function and how they carry out their, their function and their effects. And so one approach that has been taken to try to um, get around this and to, to try to help catch up to the fact that there are all these sequences that we know, but we don't know their structures, is this distributed computing approach. So um, there have been these approaches where, you know, when you're not running your computer or you're not running your PlayStation, uh, you can donate that spare computation time to helping to try to compute how proteins will fold up. And so two of these projects are Rosetta at Home, um, which is run out of UW primarily, and Folding at Home, which is uh, from here, right? And I, I, at one point, this might still be true, but it was Folding at Home was the most powerful distributed computing cluster in the world. And all of that computational power uh, was being put towards basically trying to figure out how proteins fold. And it's a really difficult problem computationally because even for relatively small proteins, just the number of possible configurations that the protein can fold up into is, is you know, astronomical, right? It's like there are so many, there are lots of different degrees of freedom and, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, just so many possibilities that it's very hard to sort of search through that space of possibilities or simulate all of those degrees of freedom to see how the protein is actually going to fold up. And on top of that, sort of like the energy landscape of these possible protein structures is very, very noisy. And so it's very hard to tell if you are, um, you know, if you're in a local minima that's good or, or if you're, you're anywhere near the right answer, basically, given sort of what the, the energy landscape looks like nearby. But because it's all about the shapes of the proteins and how they fit together, um, it's really kind of a, a spatial reasoning problem about these 3D pieces. And so we thought that um, because it's really kind of like a 3D jigsaw puzzle or 3D Tetris kind of in a way is how we were thinking about it, uh, we might be able to allow uh, people to get involved and to use their spatial reasoning in a way to try to um, complement this purely computational search and be able to actually, um, you know, work together with the computers to, to better search through the space and better find um, lower energy structures. And so to try this out, we made uh, Fold It, which is, uh, an online game that people can play for, for free. Uh, it was a collaboration between the computer science department and the biochemistry department at the University of Washington. And the players are, oh, there's my mouse. The players are able to um, compete and collaborate to try to find well-folded protein structures. The players will start from some partially folded protein structure and they have a whole bunch of different tools in the game that they can use to try to interactively refine and fold the protein to try and find better and better folds. And so then, then they also have access to uh, a lot of automated tools and algorithms that they can run when they want. So what the player can do is do a high level restructuring of the protein to try to get the pieces in roughly the right shape. And then they can actually let the computer take over at some point and run some automatic optimizations to refine the structure. And so, and that way, hopefully, the, the players and the computer are actually able, able to do each what they're good at. The players can kind of do high-level spatial reasoning and, and pattern recognition, and they can let the computer take over and do the low-level optimization of the fine details of the variables and the degrees of freedom. At this point, the game has been out for over, over five years, and uh, it's had over 400,000 people play. So next I'm going to talk a little bit about the different pieces of the game and how we took this scientific problem of protein folding and, uh, yeah. When you got, when you got people to fold the proteins, how do you solve the problem of finding out whether it's a local minimum or a global, I mean, we have the same issue, right? I mean, 
Right. So I guess in, in general, the question is sort of how do we know if the players got the right answer in the end? And the, the general answer to that is it depends entirely on the, the specific problem that we're looking at. And so I, I'll talk about that a little bit in some of the specific results. Um, but roughly speaking, we can either, you know, um, we can rely on sort of data that um, exists. We can run experiments basically to see if, they, if they've gotten the right answer or we can use data from existing experiments. Um, in the case, one example that I won't talk about but I guess probably will make it a little bit more clear is um, there are some cases using uh, x-ray crystallography where you get sort of enough experimental data to uh, confirm that you know, if you have the right structure, it'll sort of fit with the data but you don't actually have enough data to get the structure, if that, if that makes sense. So once you, you, sometimes people, in that case, people will oftentimes use um, similar related structures to, to confirm the structural, the, the, the x-ray crystallography data. But in some cases, when there aren't enough similar structures or aren't any similar structures, then you, know, you can use sort of computational methods to try to come up with something that's close enough that it fits the experimental data that you can say that you got the right answer. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of the different components that went into to making the game and uh, that, we, that we worked out to actually uh, allow the players to contribute to solving these scientific problems. So one of the first things was the interactions and we wanted, this is sort of like the tools that we gave to the player to allow them to actually manipulate the protein and refine the structure and what kinds of tools they would have to, to sort of search the space. And we wanted to make sure that the tools that we gave them were actually you know, scientifically accurate and realistic and they would actually result in plausible protein structures. And so because of that, the, um, the, the interactions that the players can do are all sort of based on um, optimizations and routines that exist in the Rosetta software package, which is actually developed at the, it's the same software package that's used by Rosetta at home, the screensaver. And so when you actually interact with the protein in the game, essentially what's happening is your sort of user interface manipulations get packaged up and turned into um, optimizations that get run underneath by this sort of state of the art protein modeling package. And then the results are given back to you in real time. And so we actually spent a fair amount of time testing this initially to see what kind of interface players would like and, and doing user testing. And so originally some of our interfaces were kind of more indirect with like levers and sliders and things like that where you could, um, you know, you would sort of indirectly manipulate the protein. But actually through, um, through sort of testing those different interfaces with users, we found that a more direct kind of interaction was desirable where you'd actually sort of like click on the protein and pull on it and, um, and launch menus and that kind of thing from the protein itself to have kind of a more direct manipulation kind of interface that the, uh, the players and the users enjoyed more and found more intuitive. So we really tried to, we tried to, to get to the point where you felt like you were actually touching and moving the protein directly yourself while still maintaining the, the, um, the, the sort of the scientific underpinnings of the Rosetta engine. So we also designed a number of different visualizations for the protein to indicate where things were sort of either working or not working to draw the player's attention to where they might actually want to focus um, their work. And we indicated a lot of these with sort of little widgets that are, um, that appear around the protein in particular areas where things are wrong or right. And these included things like clashes that show up where uh, there are two pieces of the protein that are too close together. And so you actually want to pull those apart. Uh, there were voids where there are empty spaces inside the protein that you actually should try to, to fill in and compress the protein. There are also um, exposed hydrophobics, which are essentially pieces of the protein that are on the outside, sort of exposed to the, the water that the, the protein is in, but would actually prefer to be on the interior of the protein. And I'll talk a little bit more about those later. And hydrogen bonds, which are good and kind of hold the protein together. And so all of these are indicated by these kind of widgets that, that appear around the protein. 
<clears throat> in terms of the goal, one of the challenges was, again, we don't, we don't actually know what the right answer is in the problems that we're interested in the players solving. And so we have to direct the players to an unknown solution. And so in Folded, the player's goal is to get a high score. And their score is uh, basically the energy of their current protein fold, which we can get, again, from the, the Rosetta biochemistry software. But because the low energy is good, we actually take the energy and we invert it, uh, we negate it, and then we scale it up by a large number. So instead of trying to get you know, a, a low, a small low negative number, you're actually trying to get a really a high positive number, um, which seems more like what people are used to trying to get in a game. And so what this means is that higher scores for the player are um, lower energy structures and hopefully more likely to be close to the native structure. But it's not just the individual players working uh, by themselves. There's actually a lot of social elements in the game, including um, a leaderboard for individuals. So while you're working on the game, you can see in real time your score updating as you change your protein, but you can also see the scores of everyone else who's working on that particular structure and how well you are ranking against them. So for anyone who's not in first place, they basically have a sort of a goal to try to get a higher and higher score. And if you're in first place, you probably want to get a few more points so that whoever's in second place can't catch up with you. Um, and so what this means is that we never really had to set a uh, you know, a score threshold, like in our, we didn't have to try to come up with the score that we wanted the players to get to. It's basically set uh, dynamically by the players who are competing to get the highest possible score. And in addition to the individual leaderboards, we actually allow the players to form groups. And when they are working in a, when you're in a group with other players, you can actually trade your structure with them. So when you're working on something, if you get stuck, you can actually send it out to your group and they can pick up where you left off and continue working there. And the group's score is essentially the, the highest score of any individual person in that group. And so in this way, there's sort of, there's competition and collaboration for uh, the people who are working and playing in the game. And on top of this, there's sort of more long-term leaderboards where you can accumulate lots of points over multiple puzzles. So there, and there's different categories of puzzles so players can uh, get a lot of sort of positive feedback and rewards for doing well in the game. So another uh, key aspect of the game was actually training new players who come into the game. Uh, protein folding is, is it's a relatively complicated and it's a relatively complicated game. So we have to actually teach players a fair amount before they can actually get to the point where they can compete with other players online. And so to do this, we actually have a set of tutorial introductory levels that introduce the concepts that are necessary to, to play the game. And these are actually like offline puzzles where we know the answer, they're all kind of handcrafted and they, have, they do have particular goal scores. And they're, you know, they're not competitive, there's no leaderboard, but they have um, these hints that show up and sort of guide the player from, uh, for what they need to do to actually complete that level. And there's a whole series of these introductory levels that start out very simple with small proteins with just a little bit wrong with them, and they get more and more complicated to the point where uh, hopefully if you've completed them, you're able to actually compete with the other players online. And once you've fixed everything, then you, know, you get fireworks and special sounds and things like that, and you can proceed on to the, the next level. And after the game had been out for a little while, we actually asked some of the players who were, who were doing well, uh, the top players basically, what their background was in biochemistry to kind of see if the um, tutorials were actually helping if it was just, you know, we didn't know if it was just people who were biochemists who were playing the game or what. So we actually ran a, a small survey where we just asked some of the, the top players who, the, or what their background was in relation to, to biochemistry. And it turned out that actually about three quarters of them didn't have anything more than one undergraduate course related to biochemistry. Um, so it seemed like this would indicate that, you know, the, the, there was enough of an introduction to take people who didn't really have a lot of background in biochemistry and actually let them play and compete in the game and, and stay around for a while and potentially beat some of the biochemists who were playing the game. 
So <clears throat> once we had the problem mapped onto a game, um, we didn't necessarily expect that we had gotten it right for the very first time that we tried it. So we had the game um, up and running. And at this point, we were actually able to get a lot of data from the, the players who were playing, both in terms of sort of like the scientific um, structures that they were coming up with and gameplay data about, you know, what kinds of, um, how long they were playing, what kinds of tools they like to use, and so on. And so we undertook um, this process of continuous refinement and experimentation, basically, to make the game a better and better problem-solving tool for the players, which is, this process is actually still going on today. Um, since at the very beginning, the community was still sort of learning how to play and, and we were still sort of refining the game. But essentially, uh, what we do is, roughly speaking, on, on a weekly basis, we'll, we meet with the biochemists who are collaborating with and we'll talk to them about the open problems that they're interested in, what they're working on. And we take those and we turn those into what we call puzzles. And those get posted online. And while those are available online, they can get sent out to all the players who are playing the game, and they can you know, go through the process of trying to fold the protein as best as they can, seeing how well the other players are doing and competing on the leaderboards. And all the time that they're playing, we're collecting back solution data from them, the structures that they're finding, how they're searching through the space. And that all gets logged and recorded. And then you know, at the end of the week, or however long the puzzle is up for, we can then take that information aggregate information about the solutions that the players came up with and present that back to the scientist who can then try to do some analysis and see um, you know, how well the players were doing, if there's something, yeah? Um, uh, so uh, when, uh, how do you decide how long the problem should be up, a particular problem should be up? Is it like just randomly decided or is it based on how difficult uh, the, uh, your perceived uh, Difficulty is, or do you have a target score which uh, you take the puzzle down after the reach? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they're usually up for like a fixed amount. Like when we post them, we say this puzzle is up for this amount of time. And um, sometimes we'll adjust it, but usually it's, you know, there's a, a starting date and a closing date. And, and for the most part, those are usually about a week long. Um, it's not, that's more, we, we've actually arrived at that mostly because that puts, um, like a weekend, at least in the uh, the the duration, and so that lets like everybody play. Um, there's a lot of there's sort of like a a lot of people sort of around the world who are playing, and so we try to to time things so that you know, everybody who wants to play kind of has a chance to compete. It's not totally clear that that is the actually the best amount of time for getting problem for solving a particular problem but it's sort of more to support the community. Um, there might, it might be better to leave them up for longer, um, but, but we, don't, we don't actually know for sure about that. Right, and so then we can, sort, we can take that aggregate data and that analysis from the, um, the solutions that we got back from the players and essentially feed that back into the next round of puzzles. So, you know, if there's something that the players were doing that uh, seems like it wasn't beneficial, then we can maybe penalize that in the next round of puzzles. Or if there's something that they were doing that was good, we can actually try to give more of a bonus for that. Or you know, if there was a bug, we can fix the bug and, and, and work through things that way. And so it's sort of through this cycle of continuous refinement that we're able to continually improve the system and the kinds of results that we get from the players. Um, in addition to posting puzzles, we're also often posting game updates, kind of like expansions, um, where we have you know, new features, new levels, new tools, um, support for new kinds of scientific data or visualizations in the game, and so on. And we're also getting back a lot of gameplay data from the players in terms of, oh, yeah. When you say you feed it back, <clears throat> what, the physics is fixed. It's just Rosetta at home, right? Or are you altering the physics somehow? Well, yeah, I guess you could say that, yeah. There's a lot of, it's. I'm familiar with. Yeah, the, there's, <laughs> there's, you know, there's a lot of kind of like knobs for scoring and the different tools and that kind of thing. Um, what sort of like what the parameters of the, the particular puzzle, even like where we start the players out from. You know, sometimes, um, sometimes we'll run a puzzle and we'll take 
the good solutions that players found and actually use those as a starting point for the next round so that kind of everybody can start from there. Sometimes, you know, in like a, a design related puzzle, maybe there will be, you know, too many um, of a particular amino acid and then we'll penalize that the next time around so that there aren't as many. Um, so it's kind of, or, you know, there'll be a new, um, you know, a new visualization that we want to support that we think will help. And, and then we can, this is sort of conceptual feedback in a way, right? Okay, but you're not changing the sort of physical interactions that are in, or are you? Well, we can, we can, sometimes we'll change like the energy, the energy function, right? So, you know, if you're, if the atoms are this far apart, like how much is that worth? Sometimes we'll adjust that a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So even, even at that level. Okay. But will that then go into the main, just standard Rosetta engine, those things? Or is it very problem specific? That's, in, the, in these cases, it's generally problem specific. We can, we can, there's a lot of things that we can adjust on like a per puzzle basis, including, for example, like the exact, you know, weights of terms and energy function and that kind right. of thing. Usually, actually more, more often it comes the other way. Like um, the, even the, the sort of, what, what you might consider like the standard or canonical energy function that's sort of recommended for use in Rosetta can change. It does change over time. And so, you know, when that changes, we change ours as well to match it. Yeah. So it's sort of, in some sense, yeah, like the, the physics, the underlying physics of the game are being, because it's just, it's not 100% accurate. And so it's always being refined over time. So for one example of something, uh, one experiment that we ran actually to compare um, different versions of the game to improve it over time was actually uh, how we introduced the, the, um, the, the information in the tutorial levels of the game. So there's these tutorial levels, right? They're meant to teach the players particular things. And how are we going to convey that information to them? So we ran, um, one of the experiments that we ran actually compared different methods for comparing or for uh, conveying that information to the players um, and these are sort of these little hints in the in the video before these were these little like hint bubbles and so we actually compared three different ways um, one was just giving them no help at all uh, one was giving them what we called context insensitive help where it just sort of gave them an instruction manual at the beginning of the level with everything that they needed to know and next and previous uh, page buttons and a, sort of a picture of what was relevant to that particular piece of text. And um, the third one was what we called context sensitive help, where it would, there were these event triggers that would sort of try to figure out where the player was and what they were doing in the level and actually pop up a little piece of text that indicated what they needed to do next. And for each of these, we compared um, how far players made it through the introductory levels on average. And uh, I believe these are our median levels completed. And so for no help, unsurprisingly was the worst and players only competed, completed about on average of four levels, giving them the context insensitive help was a little bit better, but actually not that much better than not giving them any help at all. Um, and the context sensitive help was actually by far the best and they completed about seven levels on average. And so, for example, this is why that context sensitive help is now the actually the, the help system that's left in the game because that was the most successful. Um, but it was kind of interesting that, you know, in playtesting we had sort of noticed that if you just give, if we just gave people kind of like a block of text at the beginning of a level, they would usually dismiss it and not read it and then maybe later realize that they wanted to know what was in the text. But um, it usually wasn't, wasn't that helpful. And so it was kind of interesting to see that um, giving the user everything they needed to know in one text block right at the beginning was actually not that much better than giving them no help at all. So that's sort of an overview, a description of the system and how, we, uh, how we've been working on it and how we've been refining it over time. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about some of the results that we've gotten from the players, from their gameplay um, in a couple different areas. The first is a protein structure prediction. And so that's, um, Basically, you know, given a sequence of amino acids, trying to find the lowest energy structure for that, that specific protein. Um, also in the development of algorithms that can refine protein structures and 
uh, actually maybe feeding back some of the strategies that the players have developed into automated methods. And a third is actually protein design and trying to um, come up with novel synthetic proteins that don't exist in nature that might have new and useful functions. So uh, for protein structure prediction, we're looking at um, can players basically figure out what structure a protein will take given its sequence of amino acids? And so to do this, uh, one of the things that we did was we ran a comparison between the folded players and the sort of state-of-the-art protein structure prediction algorithm at the time, which was called Rebuild and Refine. And we took um, 10 structures that exist that we, we had and these were uh, structures that had been solved by experimentalists, but had not yet actually been published. And so that way we knew that the players weren't cheating by looking up the answer, which I think sometimes they do if we run a published structure. Um, and so what, yeah, so we took these 10 structures and Essentially, we let the folded players work on them and we let the rebuild and refine algorithm sort of run until it had converged. And what we compared was the, the carbon alpha RMSD, which is roughly speaking a measure of the distance between proteins. And we, we looked at the, uh, the RMSD for each, um, for the players and the algorithm with respect to the correct native structure once that had been released. So at that point, we knew what the right answer was. And what we found was that in five of these 10 cases, the players did better. In about three of the cases, they did kind of similar. And in two cases, they did worse. And what we were interested in was what was it that the players had done that the, the algorithms weren't able to do, basically. And so, one, so as an example of that, um, we can take a closer look at one of these particular structures and see how what the players did compared to what the algorithm did. And this plot is kind of an RMSD plot where the x-axis, again, is RMSD and it's distance from native. So um, zero would basically mean right on the right answer. And the y-axis is energy and lower is better energy. So kind of the bottom, the bottom left there is kind of like the best area to be. Uh, and so each dot in the graph, in the chart, represents a solution structure produced either by um, the players, which are green, or the automated algorithm, which is yellow. And what had to be done, actually, in this particular structure was what we called a strand swap, because um, you can see this is where they, this is the starting structure that they were all given. And here, um, this blue region, uh, which is kind of the tail of the protein, is actually very hydrophobic and exposed on the exterior of the protein. And because it's hydrophobic, it actually would prefer to be on the interior. And so this is um, what one of the players did, this trajectory they took is this green line here. And you can see that they actually got, um, they had to essentially get a really bad energy and a really bad score before they were able to get the, this blue hydrophobic region of the protein buried correctly on the interior. So they, they almost had to unravel the protein entirely. And so what they were able to do was kind of es escape this uh, energy minima and find the right answer, where you can actually see this little kind of island of green dots here uh, is, is structures with swap strands, and only the players were able to find that. The, the automated algorithm actually kind of got stuck. You can see there's a little, a little notch in the energy landscape kind of right around right around here where the automated algorithm kind of hit and didn't really go much further. And so what we found there, interestingly, was that the players in, were able to actually correctly um, fix, they were able to fix incorrectly folded proteins that had and outperform purely computational methods. In particular, they were very good at uh, making these kinds of restructuring operations where you had incorrectly exposed hydrophobic regions and actually um, moving the, uh, the structure out of these local minima that were caused by these incorrectly exposed hydrophobic regions by sort of making the structure worse to make a space 
for those hydrophobic areas to get buried on the interior of the protein, which would generally cause the automated methods to kind of get stuck and give up and, and not escape that local minima. Um, okay, so we had seen that the players were actually able to do um, some, oh, yeah. Yeah, algorithms as opposed to the time the players got. I guess the players got one week. Uh, I mean, you can't predict how much time they actually spent, but how long did the algorithms actually take to uh, do the folding stuff? Yeah, I don't. I don't remember exactly how. It was. It wasn't like we didn't run them for for a week, but I think it was. It was sort of a standard algorithm, and I think we, we sort of ran it until it had converged and kind of stopped running. If we if it was a it was like a randomized algorithm, so you know, if we had just continued it running indefinitely, possibly, you know, it would have eventually come up with that. But but it sort of converged to this particular region of the energy landscape. And so, so those are multiple ones converging to different regions. Is that how you got the multiple uh, dots for the algorithmic solutions? Um, it was, I believe that that particular algorithm would kind of use, um, it could use a lot of, um, structures at once kind of like evolve a population of structures over time by trying different random things on them. Yeah. Okay. So we had seen that the players were able to, in some cases, actually do quite well in folding protein structures. And so we were curious what kinds of strategies and um, kind of heuristics they had developed. And we wanted to see if we could actually take those and apply those back into automated methods. So what we added to the game was what we called the cookbook, which is essentially a, a tool to allow the players to code up their strategies. Here is, is um, this video is showing one of the interfaces for it, where there's sort of a block-based um, sequence language where you, know, you, can, you can basically just make um, a linear sequence of commands that correspond to you know, moves in the game. Uh, we actually more recently added a, a Lua interpreter is embedded in the game, so the players can just basically write Lua scripts with uh, you know, all the control structures and variables that they want. Um, so, in addition, so in addition to just writing and running these uh, recipes in the cookbook, we call them, the players are actually able to share them online with other players and take other players' recipes and run them or edit them and then reshare them, uh, customize them, and so on. So there's actually a whole, you know, you can see there's these um, some share buttons down here. So there's actually a whole sort of portal section of the website that's dedicated to the uh, recipes that the players have written and run. And so we were interested in if the players were actually using this, this sharing um, interface and aspect of the game. And it turned out they actually were. And they were uh, sharing in a, some sort of interesting patterns. So there were some, so there were some recipes where um, a player would make a recipe public and shared, and a lot of other players would then download those and make their own copies and their own modifications. So these sort of shallow but wide kind of trees of um, sharing. Oh, in fact, as I should mention, so in this, each, each node, each circle basically represents a different recipe, and the size is, is roughly, um, is related to how popular it was, how often it was run. Um, so you can see there were these in some cases, these really popular publicly shared recipes that had a lot of descendants where players would take that recipe and make their own um, local modifications, maybe share some of them with their groups. Um, there were some interesting cases where there would be a really popular public recipe and the player who wrote it would kind of iterate on it and make multiple changes and then share it with their group and then keep working on it and then eventually sharing a new version of it, like a version 2.0 with everyone. and. Uh, and uh, make that public. And then there are other kinds of ones where, you know, some of the children would become actually much more popular within groups than the original parent was. So it's interesting to see that um, players were actually taking advantage of this recipe system and modifying each other's shared recipes and running each other's shared recipes. And so we were also curious about what, what the, uh, the algorithms that the players were sharing and coming up with were. And so when we looked at the very top recipes in terms of how often they were run, we noticed that there was this one recipe that was like really, really popular in terms of how many times it was run and like three times more popular than the, the next previous one. And so we were curious about what this particular recipe contained. 
And this was actually a really short Lua script that was called Blue Fuse version 1.1 that one of the players wrote. And essentially what it did was it adjusted the, inter the, the forces that the atoms used to push each other apart, the interatomic repulsive forces, and interleaved that with discrete and continuous optimization, which sort of allowed the protein to kind of contract and relax and let the atoms get a little bit closer to each other than normally they would be able to by adjusting the repulsive force. And when we looked at that, uh, one of the biochemists we were working with said, that looks very familiar. Um, we've been working on an algorithm that does almost the same thing um, that we haven't published yet, which they called fast relax. And it did a very similar thing by adjusting the, the interatomic repulsive force and doing sort of optimizations in between. And so we were curious how these two algorithms um, compared to each other. And so we ran them on a benchmark set of proteins to see um, how well they did. And in these particular charts, um, time is on the x-axis and energy is on the y-axis. So the longer an algorithm was run for, uh, the more energy it could sort of wring out of the protein. So again, the bottom left here is kind of the good region to be in. Um, and kind of as a, as a baseline, we compared to classic relax, was, which was at that time the, the published um, algorithm that the scientists were using. And when we looked at the fast relax algorithm, of course, it did quite a bit better than the, the classic relax. And when we looked at uh, the player's blue fuse algorithm, it landed somewhere in between. It wasn't quite as um, efficient as fast relax, but it was actually still a little bit better than the classic relax, which was interesting. Yeah. I'm trying to interpret the y-axis here. Is this a good increase? I mean, like, yeah. from 150 to 170, I, I like, without knowing anything about the what that means, it doesn't seem like a big difference. Mm. It's it's a pretty. It's I mean, this, so um, what these al these relax algorithms do is they don't really make like major changes to the structure. They kind of um, they're sort of things that you would kind of run near the end to refine a structure that's already mostly in the right place, uh, if that makes sense. So it just sort of helps all the pieces of the protein kind of kind of get into a, a little bit better position. So um, for that, it's I think it's a pretty good so you wouldn't change. It. No, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah, these are sort of more like in end game refinement mm -hmm. kinds of things. Um, so let's see. Um, right, so the, the it, so it kind of appeared that the, uh, the scientist developed Fast Relax was doing a little bit better than the player developed one. But to compare a little bit further, we actually re-implemented Fast Relax in the Lua scripting interface because the players didn't have access to all of the sort of parameters and options that the biochemists did when they implemented Fast Relax. So, we, we, we implemented Fast Relax using Foldit's Lua interface as closely as we could. And when we reran the, the benchmark, what we actually found was um, the player, the Blue Fuse algorithm, was actually a little bit more efficient than the Fast Relax algorithm. It was able to get a few more points a little bit quicker. And this was actually the sort of domain of time that the players were running Blue Fuse for uh, when we looked at how often, how long they ran it for on average. So it's very interesting to see that for the use case of the players, um, they actually, and the, the interface that they were given to develop uh, an algorithm, they actually came up with something a little bit more efficient than what the scientists had developed for their use case. So when we were looking at algorithm development, we saw that the players were actually able to sort of independently discover uh, an algorithmic technique through this end user development approach that was actually more efficient than some of the previous published algorithms the scientists were using. And there was this whole social collaborative um, development and identification of algorithms online. So yeah, so the next, the next part I'll talk about in terms of folded results is protein design. And this is actually coming up with a new sequence of amino acids basically that will fold up into a protein that has a particular structure. So in some sense, it's, it's kind of um, the, the inverse of structure prediction, right? You want, to, you want to design a new synthetic protein that will carry out some particular function. And so 
we added a lot of new tools for protein design, basically allowing the players to change um, the amino acids that actually make up a, a given protein in the game. And so there were new tools, new tutorial levels to introduce these and so on. And we, one of the, the cases that we looked at was to develop an enzyme for the, the catalysis of this reaction called the Diels-Alder reaction, um, where essentially there's this protein here that you, you know looks like the rest of the protein, and in the middle there's this small molecule that we want to catalyze the reaction for, um, basically by redesigning this brightly colored region of the protein to have more contacts with the small molecule in the middle. And that's what we asked the players to do. And this was actually a really interesting case because we were able to take the designs that the players came up with in the game and the biochemists were able to actually test these out in the wet lab and see actually how they worked and if, they, if they, the players had improved on the initial structures at all. And then whenever we did that, we were actually able to take the most promising structures that came out of the wet lab experiments and feed those back into the next uh, round of puzzles. And so it was this very iterative process, but this time we're actually integrating um, actual experiments in the wet lab with the, the sort of iterative process of the game and the refinement. <clears throat> and so again, this is kind of a slightly different view, but uh, we asked the players to redesign that kind of loop region on the top right to have more contacts with the, the cyan small molecule there. And what we ended up with, which was sort of a player and scientist co-design enzyme, was this dark blue one where they added two helices and they were able to make a lot more contacts with the small molecule. And it was in fact a 13 amino acid insertion from the starting structure, which is quite a drastic departure in terms of redesigning a protein. And the, the new enzyme actually had about 17 times improved efficiency over the starting enzyme. So not only did they make a really drastic departure from the original structure, but it was actually a lot more um, active, a lot more efficient than the original enzyme. And in fact, the biochemists we were working with said that it was such a drastic change to the structure that they might not actually have considered it themselves, but the players were actually able to, to come up with something that worked. So in terms of protein design, we were able to see that they were, the players were actually able to improve an existing enzyme. Uh, a really exciting part was actually this scientist and player collaboration where they would actually test out the things that the players had come up with in the lab and feed those back into the, the, the game. And the players were actually able to make these interesting and surprising changes to structures. Uh, so those were some of the results. Um, some of the things that we're looking at now in the future for Foldit is uh, interfaces using Connect and Leap and other kinds of like tablets and multi-touch interfaces to see if those can help to improve um, the things that players are able to do. Um, fitting uh, predicted structures to electron density. This is sort of a, a piece of experimental information that we can get that might help players be more accurate in their predictions. And a variety of different kinds of designs we're looking at, um, in particular like designing drugs and small molecules rather than proteins. So I have a, I have a little bit of time left, I guess. So I'll try, I'll try to go through these like really re relatively quickly so there's time for questions. But I wanted to mention two um, new games that actually we're working on now. Um, one of them is called NanoCrafter and this is based around synthetic biology. And the second one we're probably, we're thinking about calling Paradox and this is about software verification. So NanoCrafter, this is work with uh, several other researchers. But the idea with NanoCrafter is it's a game about synthetic biology. We're curious to see what kinds of nano devices we can actually engineer uh, based on using small strands of DNA to self-assemble into uh, nano devices and nanostructures that are governed by uh, DNA base pairing mechanics. Uh, so you know, A and T and C and G want to pair with each other. And so if you program sequences of DNA just right, then you can sort of predict and model how they're going to um, how they're going to bond to each other and actually make them build, you know, scaffolds and structures and things like that. Um, another important mechanic here is strand displacement, where if you have two strands of DNA that are already bound together and you have some other strand that comes in and actually um, binds to one of those better, it'll actually sort of kick off the one of the strands that's already bound and uh, you'll end up with sort of a new, a new um, 
system, a new setup. And I have some videos that will hopefully make this a little bit more clear. And again, the, one of the cool things here is we can test these in the lab. Um, so in the game, for example, you might have a, something that looks like this, but it really represents a, a, a strand of DNA that looks like that in the top left. So a lot of the sort of details of exactly what the base pairs are are abstracted away. And you kind of get these like Lego-ish um, building blocks that you can use. Um, so maybe I'll just show one of the videos. These are some of the tutorial levels where essentially in all the tutorial levels, your goal is to uh, free the strands that are have a little star on them. And so what's going to happen is the player sort of restructures some of the pieces of DNA and then hits play and then sort of the DNA dynamics kick in and there's a strand displacement and they freed the star and so they win that level. And then there are sort of these puzzles that get a little bit more complicated. These are the tutorial levels. And so again, that's, that is sort of the strand displacement mechanic that lets you make interesting cascading kind of moving devices. And then, you know, they get, the levels get more complicated. Um, as an example, this is, this is a, a walker that we built to test out the system, but you can make sort of robotic devices and things that move around. So you can sort of see there's these two legs and they'll, they'll actually take steps. And this is a really short track, but you can make it longer and the little things of DNA will, will walk along the, the track. I don't know if that's totally clear, but... Um, um, the legs, it comes with the legs, sort of this, let's see, this region here is the walker, and then these things, they're kind of like grass, they kind of come up and those are the parts of the track. And then there's little bits of fuel that come in, and they sort of remove the walker leg from a previous part of the track, and it moves forward to the next part of the track. Um, so this is something that we made just to sort of get the idea if it could support a larger system. Um, these are some solutions that players have submitted to some of the challenges that we've posted. Um, this, is, oh, this is an interesting one that uh, just forms into a, a structural three-way junction here automatically. So it kind of like builds a little subcomponent of what might be a larger structure. Um, this uses a bunch of similar copies of the same um, the same sort of strands to actually make a sort of a polymer that's self-similar to itself. It just sort of like assembles into a long, a long string. And this one is interesting. It might actually be more of a exploitation of the physics system in the game than anything else, but it's kind of, it just kind of swims along <laughs> using like a little, I don't know, motor or tail there. Again, that, that might just be more, yeah, an exploitation of the physics in the game. Um, so yeah, so this is just re actually released relatively recently last year. And so it's kind of interesting to think about um, how we, this has this sort of dichotomy between the tutorial levels and the, the science levels for the players. And um, one of the, the tensions that we always have is, um, you know, how soon should you take the players out of the tutorials into the science puzzle so they can start making a contribution um, versus, you know, how you have to sort of teach them everything in the tutorial levels as well. So how could we guide the players through those, um, given the skills that they've learned? Uh, things like, how can we actually teach the players the rules of the game? We have, we've tried a lot of things like videos, slideshows, text, again. Um, one of the interesting things is how could we let players share and customize sort of subcomponents that they've built out of pieces of DNA um, so that you don't have to like rebuild everything from scratch or see everything on the screen at the whole time. Um, and I sort of skimmed over this, but the challenges that we give to the players here are actually very open-ended textual challenges. And so we actually ask the players to rate each other's solutions. And it would be interesting to try to figure out how we could incentivize and train players to recognize and rate good solutions. In this, yeah. um, there's kind of two independent physics running at the same time. There's the, the rules, uh, in, in a general sense, there's the, the domain bonding rules, basically, like these two, or these two pieces of DNA react in this, in this order, right? And then um, there's sort of the layout, you know, where things appear on this, because that just says 
there are these different you know, pieces of DNA somewhere. There's no sort of geometric spatial information. Right, yeah, it's not at the level of base pair, it's sort of at the level of collections of base pairs, which we call domains, but, but basically, yeah, it's like these two, the next, the next thing that happens is these two react, kind of. Clicking forward into the upper left-hand screen, that so, suggests me there's some hydrodynamic model or something? Yeah, so then there's sort of the layout that makes everything, gives a, everything a piece, uh, a place to appear on the screen, and this is, um, that's actually just box 2D. Okay. Running, yeah. Okay. So it use, it's sort of like a, a mass and spring, or yeah. body and spring kind of um, layout. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I was saying. I think they're sort of they. This is sort of exploiting that aspect of the physics layout simulation to make something that kind of moves across. Um, do I have time? So like five more minutes. Yeah. Okay. So I'll go through this really, really quickly as well. Um, this is another game that's based on software verification. Um, it's currently called FlowJam, but we're sort of revamping it quite heavily, and we're probably going to call it Paradox. This is also with um, some other um, researchers at UW. But the basic idea is that we want to be able to prove a particular piece of software is free from certain classes of bugs or errors. Uh, and the approach that we're looking at is to do this through type annotations and in Java. Um, so the assumption is that most programs probably will not type check just right away. And so adding all of these annotations could actually be quite costly if you have sort of um, an experienced or expert programmer do it. So what we wanted to do was have a game where the players are essentially trying to infer the best set of type annotations uh, with the fewest type checking errors that could then go back to an expert programmer and they'd have less work to do than if they had to start from scratch. Um, <clears throat> So roughly speaking, the type annotation in Java is just some extra type information you can apply to a type. If you wanted to say, for example, prove that a, a program did not have any null pointer dereferences, you could have a type system that encoded whether a reference was null or not null. And then, for example, if you try to dereference the null, uh, something that is potentially null, you'd get an error, right? And so, right, so. Actually having uh, you know, highly skilled and expensive labor do this could be expensive. So, oh. so it might be, so in this case, what we're trying to do is translate the, the code into a set of constraints that then players can solve in an abstract sense, um, try to minimize the number of um, constraints that are violated, and then turn that back into type annotations on the code, and the original programmer has much less work to do to verify that everything um, works correctly. And so right now, the way the gameplay works is, and I'll just, again, show the video. Um, it's basically a constraint graph with variables and constraints that are connected to each other with edges. And the player can, the primary mechanic for the player is to select uh, variables to be optimized by painting over them. And once they select some, uh, by painting, those variables that they've selected are handed off to an automatic solver uh, that then optimizes them underneath and returns the result to the player. So again, the, the, the player is essentially sort of scheduling and, and um, piecewise optimizing a large optimization problem. And the hope is that the player can do um, some form of visual uh, decomposition and scheduling to do um, come up with a better solution faster than just throwing a purely op automated method at the whole problem at once. Sorry, I don't understand. So what's going on? <laughs> like, okay. I, I paint, yeah. and what is it doing? <clears throat> so each of the, the, um, the nodes is either a, the, the, blue, the blue nodes are variables, and the green nodes are the constraints. And those are given from the original code? Yeah, these are derived from code. Okay. And so the constraints are generally things like, you know, um, you know, x is a subtype of y, or x is the same type as y. And so then when the player paints, and I'll, oh, I guess this, oops, this might also be obvious, but this is all sort of like placeholder art <laughs> right now. Um, <clears throat> when the player paints, they're, oops, they are 
basically selecting variables. And when they finish painting, the system sort of packages up the variables and the related constraints into uh, an optimization problem and sends that off to an optimizer that runs in the background. And what is it optimizing? Um, it's optimizing to satisfy the maximum number of constraints. It's actually, it's, a, it's max set underneath. So there, the variables are Boolean variables and the constraints are clauses. And so this does not directly map onto the code. This is a far more abstract. Yeah, yes, it's much more abstract than the code. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. Does that does that answer? It? A bit. A bit. Oh, well, we, we, we could talk more sure. about it. But the basic idea is you have a big. At this, yeah, at this point, once it gets to the game, it's more or less. Uh, it's very far removed from the original code and the structure of the original code, um, to some extent. But the basic idea is that. Um, you have a big optimization problem and we want the player, rather than just trying to purely automatically solve it all at once, we want to let the players sort of subdivide and decide how long to spend on each region of the problem. Um, so this leads to some interesting questions such as how can those graphs that we were seeing were actually quite small compared to like the real problems that we want to solve. So there's some visualization issues in dealing with solving, uh, visualizing large constraint graphs. Actually, there's a lot of different levels that we need to organize and present to the player. Um, you know, one code base can generate a very large number of levels that need to be solved. Um, and um, Potentially, I think it would be interesting to actually learn strategies and heuristics from the players and feed those back into automated methods, kind of like we did with the cookbook in Foldit. And this actually, we're actually looking at putting this game on Mechanical Turk as well uh, and actually paying people to solve them. So it would kind of be interesting to see what uh, impact, if any, sort of the free gamified version has versus the you know, non-gamified paid version um, and how that affects you know, how much people solve, how, how long they'll play for. Okay, so, um, right. So in conclusion, I think that, um, you know, Foldit has shown a lot of promise for combining humans and computers and solving these difficult computational problems. Uh, we're looking at some other things in synthetic biology, software verification and so on. And so I think there's a lot of interesting things to be done and questions to be answered there. And if you'd like to try any of them, uh, here's the, the URLs. You can play the old, the old version, uh, the current version of FlowJam um, as well. And there's my email and website if you're interested. So thank you. Thanks for your attention. I guess I went a little bit longer. But, uh. We have time for a couple questions. Um, uh, I guess you raised your hand. Um, uh, in the FlowJam, uh, one that you showed us, if someone is not a programmer, uh, how likely is it that they could actually get anything? I mean, just looking at a constraint graph, if, you, if you're not a programmer, how likely is it that you would actually make any progress in solving that? Um, well, I think because it's it's totally removed from the code, I don't, I, my guess is that it wouldn't matter necessarily if you know how really to program at all. But how, 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 this, uh, for, for the folded example, you had hints which said stuff like uh, this is hydrophilic and this should be inside of mm -hmm. this. Hydrophilic. You can't even give them hints here, right? I mean, I mean how would they? Well, I mean, we, we, we sort of can. I guess we, we have similar, at least in this one, we have some similar um, sort of like context sensitive hints that show up, but they don't have anything to do with the code, right? It's more like the constraint graph. But it's kind of, yeah, I mean, I guess this is more removed from the application domain. Right, so we can't any you know there's any hints that we give the players aren't going to um, tie back to the original code or anything in any way, right? It's kind of it's kind of, in kind of a way, right? Like if you play fold it, you know you can learn, you know theoretically about the biochemistry, right? And if you learn some biochemistry, then that can actually help you in the game, presumably. But in this case, it's because it's completely removed from the 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 code and sort of like the source material right um it's like it's a com i think it would be a completely different set of skills right that you would develop to to solve these kinds of problems than you would if you were coding yeah if that answers hopefully that answers the question yeah yeah um do any biochemistry classes use fold it to help students learn about proton folding yeah yeah that is that's definitely the case um we 
I mean, there are teachers, I mean, some, we occasionally get emails from like teachers in colleges, high schools who say they're using it. Um, we, we also have been developing a version that could be used in, um, used in classes, right? So you can load in more, more um, structures that might be more relevant to like a curriculum like glucose, lactose, um, you know, hemoglobin, that kind of thing. Um, so it's definitely been used. You know, I've got people have assigned um, puzzles as homework, right? It was actually used in the um, edX's. I think their first their MOOC that they did for for biochemistry. One of the assignments was um, to play a certain amount of the the tutorial levels, basically. So we actually had made like a special version for them um, as well, and the. Um, the the nanocrafter also one of the one of our collaborators has actually used that sort of in his class to teach a little bit of synthetic biology I think because when you can see the strand displacement happening and things moving uh, I think it's a little bit easier to to understand than you know just sort of reading about it with static images so I think that yeah both of both of those I think could be useful for education and have been to to different extents already used in the classroom um, yeah. Uh, so is that so? Like in terms of algorithmic contributions, you obviously have that uh, cookbook mechanism and fold it. But like, you're also gathering a bunch of blogs as well from players. Um, are those at all like useful for like kind of inferring like strategies? Like, would it at all possible to be possible to like train a, something that simulates a folded player? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And so, original before before we even did the cookbook, we were kind of thinking that maybe that's what we would do. We'd try to like, you know, see what players do and learn at the level of individual actions what the players do. But um, instead, we sort of figured, well, why, why don't we see if they would, could actually, they, they probably know very well what they want to do. So look, why don't we see if they can actually code them up themselves? But an interesting thing now is uh, I think a lot of the advanced players, they use a lot of scripts. and. All the scripts are very, it seems like they're very context sensitive. Like for example, it's talking about the blue fuse. It, it only works like in this context of you're near the end, you have a relatively well-refined structure and you just want to, everything to sort of fit into place a little bit better. And so I actually think an interesting thing to do at this point would be to, to do something similar, like try to figure out if you could, um, you know, given a protein structure, which script is the best script to run? Basically, by looking, you know, like features of of structures and which scripts pe people ran at that point, and then, yeah, right, like simulate a folded player at the level of what script do I run next, rather than you know, what sort of atomic game element do I run? Yeah, um, I think you had a question. Talk about how you got people to play the game. Can can I talk about how we got people to play the game? Um, yeah, I mean, we tried, what we tried to do was, there were a lot of things we tried, we did. Um, I mean, there's, you know, this whole iterative process, you know, early on we, we, um, we had a lot of like, sort of like rapid, as rapid as we could do sort of prototyping um, early on. I mean, we, we do this with a lot of the games, like, you know, we try to get something up and running as quickly as possible, have people play them, you know, do play testing, see what people figure out, what they don't figure out. Um, we, you know, we, we throw away a lot of sort of like the early designs that don't really work that well until we come up with something that, you know, seems to um, be enjoyable as well as actually address the, the scientific problem at hand. Um, we tried to put in a lot of um, rewards, right, at different schedules. So there's everything from like while you're playing the game, if you make a good move, there's like a little pop up, right, that says like good job um, to, you know, you can do um, well at a particular puzzle, which, you know, and then there's these like meta leaderboards, right, that, you know, actually can take a couple months maybe to get to the top of, right? So there's sort of like these, there's, there's positive feedback and rewards from, you know, the, the half second to the like four month mark, basically, um, to sort of try to, try to get players involved. Um, there's a, we tried to put a lot of like social things into the game and the website, right? So there's groups, so that players work together. I think, I think my feeling is that the groups are actually quite important for this sort of like um, people wanting to stick around and play more um, rather than feeling like they're sort of just working on their own. They're actually working with other people. Um, and 
In addition to that, we also, we also put a lot into um, giving them feedback about the purpose of the game and like what's going on behind the scenes and the science, right? Like, why are we posting this puzzle? You know, how does it relate to like something in the real world? How is what you're doing helping? Um, you know, asking them like, what features do you like? What, what things would you like to see? What things aren't working? You know, so sort of trying to engage the community. Um, yeah, so, and then, I, you know, also trying to get, um, doing out, like outreach, right? Going out and giving talks, talking to, to the media. We go to like public science events and that kind of thing. So just trying to like get the word out as much as we can that the game exists and, and that kind of thing. <laughs>